Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is inflammation part 3 where we will talk about chronic inflammation. This video will contain the definition of chronic inflammation, the common causes of chronic inflammation, its morphologic features, major cells involved in chronic inflammation, and since macrophages are the dominant cell type in chronic inflammation, so we will talk in details about the role of macrophage and how macrophages become activated during chronic inflammation and also we will talk about the products of activated macrophage. Then we will also discuss briefly about the roles of other cells in chronic inflammation and we will finish our video today with brief discussion about granulomatous inflammation. Okay, so a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first question, what is chronic inflammation? How can we define chronic inflammation? Now in your textbook you will see a very long definition of chronic inflammation and I will also now tell you that but don't get scared because I will explain this definition line by line afterwards. So. Chronic inflammation can be defined as a response of prolonged duration, usually for weeks or months, during which inflammation, tissue injury and attempts at repair coexist in varying combination. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them definitions of pathology. I even have to show them teddy bear to keep them calm. So look, I am also showing you a teddy bear. So look at the teddy. Don't run away because I will explain this definition line by line now. So let's go back to the definition. What did we see in the first line? This is a response of prolonged duration. Notice from my previous videos that were on acute inflammation, we had seen that acute inflammation was of short duration and also rapid in onset. On the contrary, we can see here that chronic inflammation will be the inflammation of prolonged duration. And we have also mentioned the duration here. Usually it will be for weeks or months. So that's the first line in the definition. This is a prolonged inflammation. It is a response of prolonged duration. And the second part of the definition is even more important because three things are happening simultaneously in chronic inflammation. Although there is variation in their combination. So what are the three things that are happening here or what are the three things that coexist during chronic inflammation? You can see that I have also marked them in red color in the text. So they are inflammation, tissue injury and also attempts at repair. So all these three things, inflammation, tissue destruction, and necrosis and attempt at repair. All these three things are happening simultaneously during chronic inflammation. So now that we have defined chronic inflammation, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the common causes of chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation can happen from a variety of causes. They include persistent infection, hypersensitivity diseases, or immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Chronic inflammation can also happen due to prolonged exposure of the individual to potentially toxic agents. Now, one thing you have to remember, chronic inflammation can also happen following acute inflammation. Especially after recurrent acute inflammation, there is chance of chronic inflammation in many cases. And also you have to remember that some chronic inflammations will happen 
de novo. And we will now discuss about these different causes briefly. So the first cause of chronic inflammation was persistent infection. Now when can we have persistent infection? It will occur when the microorganism is very difficult to eradicate. Say for example in tuberculosis that is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, what do we see? We see that the organism has a special ability to evade our host immune system by preventing fusion of phagosome with lysosome inside the macrophages of our body. And this special ability makes the organism difficult to remove and as a result later it evokes delayed type hypersensitivity and chronic inflammation. Now I have two separate videos on pulmonary tuberculosis and also on phagocytosis and you can also look into those videos after watching this video to know more about those fascinating mechanism of phagosome lysosome fusion and how mycobacteria evades those immune system. So coming back to today's topic, similarly just like mycobacteria there are certain viruses, fungi, parasites that are also difficult to remove and all these organisms will result in persistent infection and that will cause chronic inflammation. The second cause of chronic inflammation was hypersensitivity diseases or immune mediated inflammatory diseases. Now chronic inflammation will happen in these diseases due to excessive and inappropriate activation of our immune system. So two important terms will be mentioned here. One is autoimmune disease and the second one is allergic disease. So we need to know the basics about these two things. So what is autoimmune disease? Well, normally the immune system of our body doesn't react against our own tissue. Our immune system knows which tissues are our own tissue and which tissues are foreign and usually they will attack the foreign invaders, not our own tissue. But sometimes we will have reaction developing against our own tissue and that is known as autoimmune disease. Examples of autoimmune disease where we can have chronic inflammation include rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, etc. In some cases chronic inflammation can result due to unregulated immune response against microorganisms. Say for example in inflammatory bowel disease we will have chronic inflammation as a result of unregulated immune response against the microorganism involved. The next term that I would like to mention here is regarding allergy and what happens in allergy is we get excessive and inappropriate response against some substance that are normally harmless. Say for example in bronchial asthma the patient may have excessive and inappropriate activation of immune system in response to pollen or some other allergen in which he is allergic to. So in allergic disease we can also have chronic inflammation. The next cause of chronic inflammation is prolonged exposure to potentially toxic agents. Now these toxic agents can be exogenous or endogenous. Examples of exogenous toxic agents that can cause chronic inflammation include silica. This is a non-degradable material and if this thing is inhaled for a long period of time, it can cause some problem in the lung, which is known as silicosis, one type of inflammatory lung disease. Similarly, example of endogenous toxic agent includes toxic plasma lipid components that can cause atherosclerosis in the long run. 
The next cause of chronic inflammation is following acute inflammation. And this type of scenario will be seen if the tissue destruction was extensive or if the bacteria or microorganism of acute inflammation survived and persisted in small number at the sites of acute inflammation. Examples of chronic inflammation that happened following acute inflammation include chronic osteomyelitis and pneumonia terminating in lung abscess. The next cause of chronic inflammation was due to recurrent attacks of acute inflammation. The next cause of chronic inflammation is chronic inflammation starting de novo. Now in these types of chronic inflammation there were no acute phases. The inflammation was chronic from the beginning and usually this type of chronic inflammation is seen when the patient was infected with organism that had low pathogenicity in the beginning. Say for example Mycobacterium tuberculosis infection is an example of this type of chronic inflammation. So now that we have talked about the different causes of chronic inflammation, now we will move on and talk about its morphologic features. And if you can recall the definition of chronic inflammation, you will realize that we have almost given away the entire morphologic feature in that definition. So can you recall the three major things that occurred in chronic inflammation simultaneously? Yes, they were inflammation, tissue destruction, and attempts at healing. And we will see the morphologic features of those three things here. So we will see inflammation, what will be its morphologic feature, there will be infiltration of inflammatory cells, and if I want to be more specific, those cells will be mononuclear cells that will include macrophages, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. But one thing you have to remember, as we will discuss later, that sometimes some other inflammatory cell, even some acute inflammatory cell, can be seen in certain cases of chronic inflammation. The next morphologic feature was that of tissue destruction. Now, tissue destruction can happen in two ways. It can happen, it can be induced by the persisting offending agent or tissue destruction can happen due to the inflammatory cells themselves. And the next morphologic feature was attempt at healing and I have two separate videos on wound healing so you can also look into that for more information but to say in short during chronic inflammation there will be also morphologic features of healing that will include angiogenesis that means formation of new blood vessels and also there will be fibrosis as well. The next topic that we will discuss is regarding the different cells of chronic inflammation and since macrophages are the major or dominant cells of chronic inflammation so we will begin our discussion with the roles of macrophages in chronic inflammation. The functions of macrophages include phagocytosis, initiating the process of tissue repair. Macrophages also secrete inflammatory mediators and they also display antigens to T lymphocyte and respond to signals from T lymphocytes as well. Among the mediators released from activated macrophages, tumor necrosis factor interleukin-1 and chemokines are worth mentioning. So before moving on to the next topic, I think it's better if we also discuss briefly about the origin of macrophages because the examiners are very fond of asking this type of questions. So macrophages derive from hematopoietic stem cells of the bone marrow and also from progenitor cells of the embryonic yolk sac and fetal liver. The circulating cells that derived from these lineage cells were called monocytes. 
and when the monocytes go to the tissue they change their name and become macrophages. Macrophages are scattered in most of the connective tissue. However, in some specific location, they are also given some specific name. For example, the macrophages that are found in the liver, they are called the Kupfer cell. Macrophages that are found in the central nervous system are called microglial cells. Similarly, macrophages in the lungs are called alveolar macrophages and macrophages that are found in the spleen and lymph node are called sinus histiocytes. The next topic that we will talk about is regarding macrophage activation. Always remember macrophages can become activated in two major pathways. They are known as the classical pathway and the alternative pathway and macrophages activated by these two different pathways will have different roles in chronic inflammation as we will see. For example, the macrophages that will be activated in the classical pathway, their role will be to help in microbicidal action, to help in killing microorganisms and also to help in inflammation. On the contrary, the macrophages that will be activated in the alternative pathway, their major role will be to help in tissue repair and they will also have anti-inflammatory effect. So now I will show you a simple image depicting the classical as well as the alternative pathway of macrophage activation. So we will begin our discussion with the classical pathway of macrophage activation. Now how will this classical pathway begin? Always remember that the classical pathway of macrophage activation can be induced by products of microorganism, say for example endotoxin. The endotoxin can interact with toll-like receptors and other sensors. Similarly, the classical pathway can also be induced by cytokines derived from T lymphocyte. Now always remember one name that is interferon gamma because this is one of the major players that induces the classical pathway of macrophage activation. Some foreign substances say for example certain particulate matter crystals can also induce the classical pathway of macrophage activation and as written in your textbook you will see that the macrophage that is activated in the classical pathway is also called M1. So what will the macrophage do once it has been activated by this classical pathway? It will increase production of nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species and it will also upregulate lysosomal enzymes. So what will be the end result of these things? Always remember that all these things will increase the ability of macrophages to destroy microorganism. At the same time the macrophage will also begin to secrete certain cytokines say for example interleukin 1, interleukin 12 and interleukin 23 and also certain chemokines and all these things will stimulate inflammation. So that was in short about the classical pathway. Moving on to the alternative pathway of macrophage activation, I have already said previously that the main role of the alternate pathway is to help in tissue repair, fibrosis and also it will have anti-inflammatory effects. And this pathway will be induced by cytokines namely interleukin 4, interleukin 13. These are produced by T lymphocytes and some other cells. So these cytokines will activate the macrophage in the alternate pathway and that will result in production of growth factor and they will promote angiogenesis and they will also stimulate collagen synthesis and 
activate fibroblast as well and all these things will help in tissue repair at the same time the alternatively activated macrophage which is also called m2 in your textbook will also have anti-inflammatory effect with the help of interleukin 10 and tgf beta so now that we have talked about the major roles of macrophages now we will move on and talk about the other cells of chronic inflammation and they will include lymphocyte plasma cell eosinophil mast cell and even neutrophils can be sometimes found in certain chronic inflammation as we will see so that's a very interesting thing we always uh, think of neutrophil as acute inflammatory cell which is true for most of the cases but also remember that in some rare cases we can see neutrophil in chronic inflammation as well regarding the roles of lymphocyte always remember that lymphocytes will be mobilized in both antibody and cell mediated immune reaction and always remember that lymphocyte and macrophages will interact in a bi-directional way now what do we mean by that it means activated T lymphocyte will produce cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 17, chemokines that will help in macrophage recruitment. Activated T lymphocytes will also produce some other cytokines like interferon gamma that will activate macrophage as shown in this diagrammatic image. At the same time, once the macrophages are activated by the T lymphocyte with the help of different types of cytokines and chemokines the activated macrophages themselves in turn will stimulate the T lymphocyte by presenting antigen to the T lymphocyte and also by some cytokines like interleukin 12, interleukin 23 and interleukin 6. So that's why it is said that uh, during chronic inflammation we will see that lymphocyte and macrophage will interact in a bi-directional way activated T lymphocyte will activate macrophage and that will again activate the T lymphocyte now one important thing you have to note that macrophage is also an antigen presenting cell now can you recall the other antigen presenting cells this is very high yield information the examiners will often ask you what are the other antigen presenting cells besides macrophages so the antigen presenting cells are macrophages B lymphocyte and dendritic cells so these are the major antigen presenting cells so always keep that thing in your mind the next cell type of chronic inflammation is plasma cell. Now, what is a plasma cell? Plasma cells are the terminally differentiated B lymphocytes. They produce antibodies that are directed against foreign antigen or against altered tissue components. Okay, so that is plasma cell. The next cell type in chronic inflammation is eosinophil and we all know that eosinophil are involved in parasitic infection and eosinophil count also increases in allergic reaction now why do eosinophil count increase in parasitic infection the idea is eosinophil is a granulocyte and they have granules that contains major basic protein or MBP and this is a cationic molecule and that thing is toxic for parasites so that's why eosinophil uh, count increases in parasitic infection to neutralize those parasites with the help of major basic protein found in the granules of eosinophil at the same time always remember that eosinophils are also involved in immunoglobulin E mediated immune reaction. So IgE or immunoglobulin E mediated immune reaction, there is a role of eosinophil in those things. And that's why eosinophil will be also seen in increased amount in allergic reaction. 
and whenever there is increase eosinophil the condition is called eosinophilia mast cells are also found in chronic inflammation but you also have to remember that mast cells can be seen in acute inflammation as well and the most important thing regarding mast cell is they can express surface receptor that can bind with FC portion of immunoglobulin E. So this is very important. The examiners are often fond of um, this information. They may ask you um, what is the role of the um, surface receptors of mast cell. So we have to say that the surface receptors bind with FC portion of immunoglobulin E. And whenever certain antigen certain specific antigen binds with those immunoglobulin E that results in mast cell degranulation and that results in release of mediators. And from my previous video on inflammation part 2, I am sure you now know that uh, we will see histamine that is released from mast cell degranulation. This type of mast cell degranulation can happen during allergic reaction to food, to certain drug, insect venom, and sometimes they can even result in anaphylactic shock as well. The last cell type that I will talk about is very interesting and that is neutrophils. Now we all know that neutrophils are characteristic cells of acute inflammation. However, in some chronic inflammation, we can see neutrophil persisting for months as well. Say for example, in osteomyelitis, that is a chronic bacterial infection of the bone, we can see neutrophilic exudate that can persist for months. Neutrophils may also be responsible for causing chronic lung damage in smokers. The last topic of today's video is about granulomatous inflammation. Now what do we mean by granulomatous inflammation? It is a distinctive form of chronic inflammation that is characterized by focal accumulation of activated macrophages. The site of granulomatous inflammation is called granuloma and sometimes there will be central necrosis as well and often there will be also presence of T lymphocyte. Now the examiners may ask you why does granulomatous inflammation occur and then your answer will be granulomatous inflammation develops when a cell tries to contain an offending agent that is very difficult to eradicate and as we will see later activated macrophages are the most characteristic feature of granulomatous inflammation and uh, they will develop plenty of cytoplasm and they will start to resemble epithelial cell and then they will be called epithelioid cell notice the spelling and that means they will be epithelial like or they will resemble epithelial cells so always remember that in granulomatous inflammation there will be activated macrophages the activated macrophages will become enlarged they will become flattened they will have abundant cytoplasm and they will resemble epithelial cell and then their name will be epithelioid cells and also remember that sometimes these uh, cells will fuse with one another and then they can form multinucleated giant cells as well there are two types of granuloma they are foreign body granuloma and immune granulomas so let's talk about these two types of granuloma. Now foreign body granuloma develops against inert foreign bodies that are large enough to evade phagocytosis but do not produce any immune response. Examples of such foreign material include talc, suture, 
fiber, etc. And also remember that talc is often used by intravenous drug abusers. So taking history of the patient is very important. And always remember that in this type of granuloma, there will be absence of cell-mediated immune response. And usually we will see that since phagocytosis cannot remove um, these foreign particles, so there will be epithelioid cell and giant cell formation that will oppose to the surface of foreign body and try to contain that foreign body or try to wall off that foreign body. So that is foreign body granuloma. Moving on to the immune granuloma, this will happen in response to persistent T-cell mediated immune response. Immune granuloma will develop when there will be presence of some microorganism or some other inciting agent that is difficult to eradicate and that also causes immune response. So what will be the morphology of a granulomatous inflammation? In the usual hematoxylin and eosin staining preparation, we will see activated macrophages in the granuloma. How can we see, how can we identify activated macrophages? They will have pink granular cytoplasm, they will have indistinct cell boundaries and they will resemble in many cases epithelial cell and then their name will be epithelioid cells. The epithelioid macrophages or epithelioid cells will be surrounded by lymphocytes and if the granuloma is older then around those lymphocytes we may also see a narrow rim of fibroblast and connective tissue and frequently we can also see giant cell multinucleated giant cells as well in a granuloma these giant cells will have 40 to 50 micrometer diameter and they will have multiple nuclei in certain types of granuloma, say for example in Mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, there may be presence of a central zone of necrosis that will appear granular, amorphous and cheesy and those type of areas will be called caseous necrosis. Under the microscope that area will appear structureless, amorphous and eosinophilic and there will be complete loss of cellular details in those areas. So we will finish today's video with a table showing diseases caused by granulomatous inflammation. So in this table we can see tuberculosis, leprosy, cat scratch disease, syphilis, sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease etc and their causative agents. So this concludes today's video on chronic inflammation. Since inflammation was a very big topic, so I tried to make three separate videos on inflammation to cover the major aspects of inflammation. As for my viewers, if you like my videos, do subscribe, share, comment and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. So, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.